So I'm um, today going to talk about how to make reproducible manuscripts. So thinking about writing a paper for a scientific journal as opposed to writing an informal report for your collaborator. For this, I still use LaTeX, you know, the uh, typesetting um, software, fo you know, focused mostly on um, math and, and technical manuscripts. It's possible that you could, that you can get by with our markdown, but um, I still like LaTeX and I'm going to try to justify that to you and why I think that it's worthwhile putting some effort into learning LaTeX. Um, this is not for everyone. And th this lecture is also still pretty R focused. Um, but yeah, ask, ask me questions as you go along. If, if you're, if you don't, if, if you're wondering how it might apply to you in your situation. The um, Yi Wei Ji that wrote R, uh, that wrote the knitter package for R um, and that really introduced the use of Markdown for uh, reproducibility or reproducible documents in R. Um, so now it's sort of been developing R Markdown for everything. There's, you know, a book down package for writing books or or book like objects. You know, it could be um, not a formal book, but something that's sort of a, you know in the shape of a book. Uh, blog down is an R package for making websites. Package down is an R package for making websites for R packages. It's sort of organizing documentation for software. Zeringen is a, a package for um, making you know web-based slides for talks. Page down is a, a package for using R Markdown to make resumes and letters, you know, things that come out and um, have pages. And um, others have used that page down package to make a package called poster down for making scientific posters. Um, all of this just using Markdown and R and um, these sort of knitter code chunks. You, you know, you can, and you can also, you just use the R Markdown package to make um, journal articles. But I still write my, you know, articles for scientific journals using LaTeX. LaTeX um, is a document, document, a system for making, for creating documents using plain text that you, you mark up in ways similar to HTML or, um, or Markdown. That every LaTeX document starts with this backslash document class, really backslash and some word and then things in brackets or things in braces are the sort of the main way that you mark up documents in LaTeX. So different kinds of document classes you can have. Um, this one is an article. Um, and it, you, you, so you, you can, you know, def, the, the document will also have this, you know, begin document and end document where, where the paper actually is. Um, and ideally the, the document is focusing on kind of the syntax of the art or the, the semantics of the article rather than the style. Um, you know, that here's a section and this is the section title and so forth. Um, and kind of a, a main selling point for LaTeX has been, you know, a simple system for creating equations that are, is super flexible for making basically any kind of math equation that you want, um, including um, sort of inline equations and then the double dollar signs indicates display equations where you can get um, superscripts and um, you can put um, hats on top of Greek letters 
you know, everything that you might want to do. The, um, what I actually do in my late deck document tends to be to ignore the um, sectioning and that kind of semantics and really just focus on the mucking about and moving things around. So reorganizing stuff to have the page layout be exactly how I want. And if I want a section header, just like make bold and large text like this centered say, um, I guess that's the title and a section header, just sort of do it brute force. I wouldn't recommend this, but this has been sort of tended to be the way that I've done things. And what, what I, what I like about LaTeX is I can kind of is that I can control the placement of everything in the document, you know, to the millimeter or less than a millimeter. It can really give you precise control over how things look in the document. Um, and you know, when I'm sending a paper to a journal to be reviewed, I want it to look exactly a certain way. Or, you know, all the slides for these for these lectures i'm still using latex for them because i can if i need to move something over by you know three angstroms i can i can do that with latex i can make things look exactly like i want um that fine control of the document appearance the transparency about how it was achieved because it's exactly these um um, it's explained precisely. It's all with code, basically. Um, the ab ability to use version control on these documents, um, you know, in comparison to say if you were doing Word, um, that the 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 paper that the text of the paper that I'm creating, and the the code that creates the layout is just all plain text, and I can use um, Git with to you know merge changes from a collaborator or to show use to show differences um, between between um, commits that sort of thing the typesetting of equations is it you know the the real seller for latex um, you can the with you know add-ons you can do the typesetting of equations in markdown um, and really in, you know, in principle, everything that you're doing in LaTeX, you can do in Markdown. Um, but I still find that, um, Markdown is, is, you know, not quite ready or sufficiently rich for what I need. Um, there's this R package called articles that, um, basically provides a bunch of templates for, different journals so that you can write an R Markdown document and have it be converted to um, the LaTeX document and ultimately to a PDF for just for submitting to a journal in the journal's required format. Um, and I think many people are just using that directly and just using R Markdown. My own experience has been that um, there will be that it will mostly work, but it will, when it doesn't work, it won't work in a way that's that fixing it is gets really complicated. And so, and the, I mean, really the only way to fix problems that you get with these templates for different journals is to go into kind of the muckiest part of LaTeX. Um, you, and you, you can't really fix those problems without knowing LaTeX. So there's some, even if you're going to use Markdown and a, a LaTeX template, like as distributed with the R package articles, it's good to know the LaTeX itself to help you through any problems that show up. So, um, most things exist in this spectrum between being simple 
and being flexible. You can't, it's hard to have both simple and flexible. It's either simple, but you have to go with whatever's provided for you, or it's flexible, but it's hard. Um, and, you know, our markdown is, is in the, the, the simple part. Um, and, and LaTeX is, is way out here towards the, the flexible part. Um, cumbersome to write, but you can do whatever you might want. Including you can make this, um, make this, this kind of formula thing here. What I did was, um, center the line and make the text large and put a simple and the flexible inside there. Um, and then a long left, right arrow is a, a special math equation thing. And this um, backslash quad, it adds a little bit of extra space to make it be, um, so that the layout matches exactly what I want. So LaTeX gives me the ability to do whatever I want, but um, and have exact control over how it's going to look in the end. But it means that I'm writing these big obnoxious expressions like this. You know that um, you 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 know you wouldn't have to do if you were doing Word, I suppose. Um, I guess, and you know, I, I I think I've said this before, that I think a key principle in being productive is that you modify your desires to match the defaults. That if, you know, if our markdown wants to behave a certain way, or if LaTeX wants to behave a certain way, that it, rather than like spend a day or two days. Um, trying to fix it to make it exactly how you want. Maybe you should just like give up and say the person that wrote this software had a certain idea for why it's that way and I'm going to just modify my desires to match those defaults. Um, and sort of related principle is to try to focus your compulsive behaviors on things that actually matter rather than on moving stuff about to, you know, having that text a little bit farther away from the double arrow um and and you know focus on the content rather than on the the appearance for example um but you know for some things if you're you know if you're giving a talk to the national academy or you're writing a paper that is like really important to you that the um, it can be worthwhile to put that extra effort into, you know, fine controlled things. And LaTeX gives you that same kind of control on a, a written document that, you know, R gives you over graphics, you know, data graphics. Um, this is just a slide showing stuff that I do a lot. Um, the 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 default font in LaTeX is I think pretty terrible. So I will often use these add-on packages. The use package is similar to library in R to change the font to Palatino, which is one of my favorite fonts, or Times, which is sort of the standard, you know, commonly used serif font. Um, often I'll, I'll use this bit of ugly code that I don't really understand what any of that stuff means, but it, so that rather than have the text be, um, sort of flush left and right on the two, on the two margins, this makes it the, the, the right side of the text, you know, over here be, um, ragged. You can define new commands as you can kind of, as you might expect from um, the you know our past lectures. I often want to like 
text version of the term laud in math equations. And this is a, a way that I use to do that. You can define sort of macros or shortcuts that to, so you write where you might write text laud, you could just write backslash laud. Um, for a paper that I'm just sending to a journal, I'll often want to make things double spaced is the way I use to do that. Um, in these, um, in, in tops, I might want to, you know, go to a next slide without changing the slide number, and this is the way that I do that. Um, if I want to make the figure name in bold, or and have you know, the figures be like S1, S2, S3. This is the, the code that I use for that. Um, in tables, I often want to have a bit more space between rows. And sometimes I want paragraphs to not be invent, indented, but to have spaces between paragraphs. And this is code that I use to do that. Um, you can see, so, I think it's you know similar to Word that you can make kind of you can adjust the background style for a Word document and then just focus on the 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 semantic aspects of here's a section header and just start writing. Um, you could do the same thing in LaTeX of have all this kind of mud out be in the background and you just focus on the the details, um, but to do so, I think you know, similar to in Word, requires that you actually know what's going on in many cases. And um, I haven't really bothered to totally understand what I'm doing, and so I often muck about in complicated ways just to get stuff to do what I want. It's sort of this. The central bit about what I'm talking about today is really using LaTeX to get fine control over documents and have those documents be reproducible. Um, you can use LaTeX with the Knitter package and make um, and so you can have fully reproducible um, paper manuscripts, um, but the the main difference here is that you it, um, rather than have code chunks define the way that we were, which was a, a sort of markdown kind of way, the code chunks end up having to be modif be marked up in a, a different way if it's within LaTeX. Um, so you have a regular LaTeX document, and then you have you know chunks of code like this one that are um, going to be called when when the when the document is first run through R it will it will knitter will identify this as a code chunk and will um, run this bit of R code so instead of having you know the you know the the three backslashes and the and the curly braces oops I can't even draw um, <laughs> I Instead of having um, three backslashes, curly braces are in the chunk name like that, um, we instead have this business that is um, that has got all that stuff between two less than signs, two greater than signs, and an equal. And then instead of having um, Three back, three back ticks to end the thing. We have an at sign at the end of the code chunk. Why is why are we doing this versus using the stuff that we're doing in our markdown? The main reason for that is historical. That Knitter was derived from this other language um, or this other system for making these kinds of documents, Sweep, and this is the format that Sweep used. But secondly, it's like the um, the way Knitter works is does first a search and replace, or a, does a search for a pattern, um, and then extracts the code that needs to be run and runs that code. And 
the the nature of the the thing that you're going to search for kind of depends on the the nature of the the code that surrounds it that these end up being easier to do a search for in LaTeX than the you know the the three um, back ticks which are easier to search for within our markdown maybe um, anyway we can use um, we can sh shove code chunks into LaTeX the same way we shove code chunks into our markdown the only difference is that we have a different way of marking those code chunks further um, with with sort of inline code chunks instead of saying you know where we might have said um, back tick r and then my round lm out dot co two comma one back tick here we're using this um, s expression with a curly brace and then another curly brace at the end so something that looks more like a LaTeX thing. Um, but, uh, you know, otherwise, um, your, your use of, of R code chunks within LaTeX is identical to the use of R code chunks within Markdown. The only difference is the nature of these, um, the, the, the marks that delineate the code chunks and delineate the inline code. If you want to control the 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 figure size within um, one of these within a plot that you're making. You, you can do the same sort of things of, of figure width, um, where this is out dot width to, it controls the, the, the size of the figure as it will appear in the document. Um, you can again put um, really anything that you want within the double quotes here, um, including you can put LaTeX code back text width is the width of the of the page and so i can put 0.8 text width that's going to be interpreted as latex um, i need to double backslash the backslash because it's interpreted by r and then turn into latex but i can put use sort of latex commands to control widths of output within these documents too think one I mean one of the challenge I mean there are a number of challenges in using latex um, learning latex um, that you have to remember all these different codes for things one way to one way to get around that you know steep learning curve with latex is to use a WYSIWYG sort of software like um, this program licks. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I pronounce it licks. Um, but basically, it, it's you know sort of a word-like environment w that is producing LaTeX documents, where you can use um, drop-down menus of various kinds to help control the um, the appearance of things, and it ends up. But behind behind the scenes, it is just LaTeX, and um, so you use you can use this both to learn LaTeX or just to if you if you want to focus on um, the appearance at a higher level rather than on all this code to do things. And this this software does work with Knitter, so you could put our code chunks into there and use use Knitter. Um, have a LaTeX, LaTeX and and R mixed together, but where the environment is more like a word situation. Um, there there are also uh, a few online sort of collaborative tools for using LaTeX. So if you wanted 
to write LaTeX documents with a collaborator. Overleaf is seems to be the one that most people have moved moved to now, but there's this also this Authoria um, websites where you can jointly work on LaTeX documents, and it has this kind of WYSIWYG. You know what you see is what you get. Um, in um, display so that you can you don't necessarily need to know LaTeX in any detail to to work on these documents together. I, I should also em emphasize here there are a variety of different flavors of LaTeX. Um, the PDF LaTeX is kind of built on LaTeX, but it has a bunch of features that allow you to, for example, include PDF figures or PNG or JPEG figures within a LaTeX document, um, which the vanilla LaTeX didn't allow you to do. Vanilla LaTeX basically required all figures to be postscript figures. So I think most people, they when they talk about LaTeX, they're actually using this PDF LaTeX uh, version. Um, Z LaTeX. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it has an advantage that it has more control over fonts. So I'm often using this version of LaTeX that where I can control the fonts to be somewhat different than the, the standard ones. And this Lua LaTeX, um, its big advantage is, is to get Unicode characters in. So if you want to be able to, for example, put emojis or um, or if you have Unicode text that includes, um, say, um, foreign accents or symbols um, without using the proper LaTeX code to create them, this is a good, um, th this is the, this has great support for Unicode. So you might use LaTeX, but use this version to really compile it. Um, you know, the document itself will all look the same. It looks like LaTeX, but rather than use LaTeX to convert it from the LaTeX document to a PostScript or PDF document, you would call PDF LaTeX or Z LaTeX or Lua LaTeX. LaTeX. Um, Let, you know, LaTeX, like um, like anything else, um, will lead you to be struggling now and then. And, um, you know, it's like any other kind of programming language, I guess. The, the main ways to get help are first, like, if you Google the error message or Google the thing that you want to use, um, that you want it to do, and... Um, Secondly, there's, you know, there's a, a, you know, kind of stack overflow like site of questions and answers. There's techstackexchange.com that you can Google that section and you'll often find that someone else has run into the same problem and asked the same question. My personal experience with this tech stack exchange has been, has not been all that great in that, um, Spent it's, but maybe it's that my LaTeX problems are are different than others somehow. I'm not sure. Um, I haven't. I've posted some questions there and haven't gotten great answers, and I've had a harder time finding solutions there versus other places. But it is a place to look. You know, talking to a friend, looking at other people's documents are great ways to um, get solutions to problems. Um, And then also resigning yourself to have something that's less than what you want is, you know, always a solution. Like you can't, you know, don't kill yourself over it. Um, you can't get something to work the way you want. Just brute force it or leave it how it is. Um, what? So LaTeX is really focused on creating um, page-based objects, you know, PDFs where things are in pages. And in addition to the, the 
you know, getting math equations into the document. Another big selling point of LaTeX has been sort of the automated um, control over where figures end up sitting. Uh, I personally, though, it's been a real pain that um, LaTeX gives you a lot of control over how figures get placed within the text document, but it also is where you end up fighting most of the time. Um, it, you know, in LaTeX, you'll end up with the, with something like this, that there'll be this begin figure, end figure, where the figure will end up getting s s placed. Um, you'll have include graphics that will include the actual, you know, image file that you're creating. And you'll have some caption that is sitting underneath the, um, you know, underneath the figure. And the way that you do that within, within, you know, as, you know, in our code chunk with LaTeX is that you would provide the, the caption using this um, fig.cap chunk um, option. And and that that's what you get down here at the bottom. Um, tables in LaTeX, I, all, there's you you have a ton of control over how uh, how to create tables in LaTeX. Um, it, it's basically using this tabular environment where you can. Um, you define each row one at a time with with ampersands in between the columns that you're creating and backslash two backslashes at the end of a line to say go to the next row so you define each row in a table one line at a time and you can put horizontal lines to delineate the you know the top and the bottom of the table or to separate kind of the header from the table from the body of the table um, I don't know if, about your experience in trying to make tables in Word. I find tables in Word to be super painful. Tables in LaTeX, tables are just inherently painful. Um, tables in LaTeX, you have um, you have the you have great control over them, but the control comes with kind of a punishing effort to create it. But there, the X table package, which I, I had always already recommended for, um, you know, as a way to make tables in an R Markdown document, it is really um, does a great job for LaTeX based tables of tables that you want to appear in a PDF document. X table, I think, is the the if you're using LaTeX, X table is the the R package you use to make tables. And I will, I'll generally, um, you know, f first, you know, have some code that, that lays out the table in some way. And then, and then I'll call X table and the X table function to make the table sit as I want it within LaTeX. Um, and you, you probably have to use this results as is um, to have the have it spit out as as straight LaTeX. Um, you can you can have some con control over it, like it, avoiding it have a be a floating object by using this print floating equals false, and then it has strictly the ta the tabular environment in there and not within a, a kind of floating table environment. Um, X table gives you a ton of control over layout of tables in LaTeX. It's the, the, the thing they use. Um, what, one other point I want to make about, you know, I like LaTeX because it gives me, a, I can have, you know, perfectly reproducible documents. Once it actually gets submitted to the journal and a copy editor takes over, they 
they can destroy every aspect of the reproducibility. Because I don't know what happens at the journal by the copy editor, but often the math equations that you write get sort of reformatted in a completely different system. So this is a paper from 15 years ago. It's really the, the key result in a long paper is this equation here um, and how it actually ended up appearing in the journal. They had taken what was supposed to be an eight and they turned it into a two. Um, so if, you know, when you, if you submit a paper to a journal and it is finally, you know, goes through the whole review process, it's finally accepted, they will typeset it for the journal as it's going to appear, even if it's just the journal online, and they'll send you these page proofs to look at. Um, I recommend to you that you spend, set aside a day and really look through them carefully um, and look like item by item because you don't want to be burned the way I have been several times of like, I, I totally missed this. And it was, it was published with that too, when it was supposed to be an eight and we ended up having to print a correction. Um, Cause the, the copy editor can copy editor will totally destroy your careful reproducibility. I got back at them later um, by sending them this table to typeset. I don't, I don't know if they were like hand typing this stuff again. Like I didn't hand type this stuff. I um, these equations in this in this 2012 paper were were generated from code um, rather than being hand typed. They I looked through this carefully when it was printed and they didn't mess it up, but um, and partly I, I mean, well, it sounds funny if I say that I included this in that paper just to get back at them for their previous mistake. There's probably a totally different person that had to handle this table than the previous one. Um, for um, references, for references in LaTeX, um, use this system called BibTeX. So it's a separate program, BibTeX, for making bibliographies. Basically, each each article that you're going to cite, um, you have a record that's like this that that um, encodes the the you know, it gives, you know, structured data about the authors and the journal and the pages and the title and stuff. And if you use, if you keep track of your references using software like EndNote or Mendeley, um, they can produce these BibTeX, they can produce um, the reference database in this BibTeX format that you can use. Um, Within within the document, you end up um, using site P or site T, typically to to cite to you know to cite the references. This will end up being you know like sort of like text, and this will be a parenthetical thing. Um, there's a lot of control and a lot of different um, you know bibliography styles that you can apply to this. It can get really complicated or you can, you know, just go with whatever it gives you. Um, but ultimately, you, I mean, if you're submitting a paper to a journal and you're using LaTeX, you'll want to um, get to use this BibTeX. I think also if you were submitting a paper to a journal using using our markdown i mean if you're using our markdown to create it with that articles package i mentioned before you'd also want to get to know this bib test and for making bibliographies so, um just going back sort of at a higher level to the question of how to organize your analyses for a paper. Um, 
to make sure that the, the work for the paper is reproducible. What, what I tend to be doing is I will have like an, an, a project folder or directory for, for a project which has all the has the the main data set and all the analyses that I'm doing to try to figure out you know what's try to make sense of the data for that project and I have everything encapsulated into some project directory um, when it comes to writing a paper I will usually create a separate directory in that is you know the paper for that project or one of the papers for that project and that paper directory I often will have I'll make a subdirectory that has like an extract of just the analyses that are being used for that paper. So whereas the main project directory is like can have, you know, the analysis, all the analyses related to that project, which will end up being in four different papers. Um, here I might have it just the subset of the analyses that are really used in that particular paper. Um, and I may also include, you know, in that, um, I may create links in my paper directory to our data files that are in, you know, outside in that separate project directory and draw on data sets that are in the project directory. Make them look like they're sitting inside the paper directory, even though I have just, I've not made a copy, I've just made this sort of symbolic link. And ideally, each part um, is well organized and fully reproducible. In, in practice, it can be difficult to do that. Um, and what I, what I tend to do is is to have the analysis. I have um, like an R markdown report in that analysis subdirectory that's really sort of documenting different aspects of the analysis as it's done. And then the paper itself will draw on those results um, without incorporating them completely. In many cases, when I'm writing a paper, I feel like it's best to sort of go back to the beginning and redo the analyses sort of in a reorganized way. That, you know, this project directory at the top is um, sort of developed over the course of two or three years and like by the time I get to where we're going to write a paper it's um, I've really figured out how I might have done it better and so I'll I might redo much of the analyses again in a reorganized way that's more clear and simple um, I think the ideal thing, if time were never an issue, I would, when it came down to a paper, I would have the paper be like starting from scratch and redo everything in a fully reproducible way, sort of completely separate from what happened in the project directory. In, in practice, I often will pull in um, pieces of say the data cleaning part from a separate project directory um, without showing all the details of how that was done. I think I would like to make it that sort of every number in my paper is coming from code and not being hard coded. Um, and one of the ways that I do that is to is will be to like define the numbers one through ten, and you know capitalized versions of them, so that um, in the in the paper, you know if I want just a numeral that I could use sort of inline code that draws out that variable as a number, uh, but I can refer to it you know, as a lowercase, the word that corresponds to the N, or I could refer to it in as a capitalized version of the word that corresponds to the number N. Um, this, you, you might be, I'm, I'm sometimes tempted, like if I'm talking about 
one grasshopper or two grasshoppers, sometimes tempted to to really control over um, whether the whether grasshopper is going to have an S at the end or not, according to, you know, put a little if else in there. Am I going to paste in an S or not paste in an S? This is probably um, going overboard that you know that the number is one or that it's bigger than one and you um, leave the text. It, you, you don't try to do that totally programmatically. Um, but you, I mean, I guess the, the point, my point here is that you could, if you wanted to totally control singular and plural nature of text, you could do that um, in code this way. Um, probably not worth it. You know, just as with a, you know, an R markdown report, you could include the R code for the figures within the paper document, within that LaTeX document, and have when it's run, the figures get created and inserted into the document. I've come to feel that for papers, I would generally rather to have many of the analyses separate from the, the manuscript document, many of the figures that are being created in separate in code that's separate from putting it in the manu manuscript document. So rather than have a single document that's sort of all encompassing, creates the code to make the figure, I mean, has the code that creates the figures and so forth, that I'll split those figure figures out the code for them as separate R files. Um, and I'll have a make file that will create those figures, those the you know the create figure PDFs, and then within the LaTeX document, I'll do like include graphics to include the, the figure PDF in there. The I think that the um, and one reason to do that is that journals will often ask you for separate figure files. And so it can be useful to, to have them separated in this way. Um, but also secondly, that I often find that I want those figures and the code to make those figures to make, say, you know, slides for a talk that's about this work. And um, having to go into the paper and pull out the code and make sure that I have it in the right way can be a, kind of a pain later on. And it, it's much easier if I have it already as a separate, um, a separate script like this. So I think I'd come to feel that most of the time for papers, it's best to make separate scripts that make each figure that what you want to produce and sort of the bulk of the main analyses to have them be separate from the paper, its manuscript itself, and have the manuscript draw from those as needed. Um, and that sort of modularity of the documents and the scripts um, helps to make it so you can reproduce it for, you know, making separate, using those figures in a different way, like in a talk or in a course. Um, yeah, and just to emphasize that you should use version control for manuscripts. Um, I, probably the biggest selling point for using LaTeX or Markdown for manuscripts versus Word, the biggest selling point is that you can, that it, it fits into a version control system like Git in a better way. Um, however, when I'm using version control, I um, mostly am keeping that version history of my manuscripts completely private. It's either just sitting on my hard drive and no one else in the world will ever see it, or I have a private um, repository either on GitHub or Bitbucket that's private just to me and maybe my closest collaborator. And I will often include reviewers' reports and my response to reviewers' comments, you know, in that same repository. And 
when I submit a manuscript, I will put the PDF inside that repository just as a um, save the exact version of the submitted and final manuscripts in that repository for my own reference. But that repository, I won't share with anyone else. I will um, put a make a public version of that of the you know the source for my paper in a public repository. But I tend not to want to show the whole history. I don't think I don't I don't want people to see the the whole set of you know 30 commits or whatever that went went into me writing a manuscript. I want them just to have access to um, that last step. Really, like when I submit the manuscript, I will make a completely clean repository that has just one commit that is here. The manuscript just like showed up out of out of nothing, and I won't show the history of how it gets there. I often will maybe include some of the changes that I made from when I submitted the manuscript to how what the version that got accepted at the journal. I'll show that part. Um, in that public repository, but mostly like, you know, the, the underlying thing has hundreds of commits over the course of a year. The final thing that people see has like three commits total that is, you know, the version I submitted, the thing that changed to make it finally accepted and fix some typos that I found in the copy editing part of the process. Um, that more than half of the papers that I'm an author on, they're really being led by some collaborator and the, my collaborators are all using Word. Um, so I'm usually with papers that I'm working on with a collaborator, I'm writing the text of the, I'm describing the methods, I'm writing much of the results section. I'm usually stuck with Word to do that. Um, I want my analyses and my figures to be fully reproducible, and but they won't be with the Word issue. So the, the, mostly the way that I deal with that is that I create an R Markdown document that has the detailed results sort of you know, goes along all the analyses in the Word document in exactly the same way, but as a reproducible document. I don't bother with LaTeX in this sort of thing. It's just a kind of plain R markdown going to an HTML document. The sort of number by number um, how it was created um, so that you can then line it up with the Word document and see exactly what, um, see that the numbers that are in the Word document really are matching what is coming from the data. But in summary, I find LaTeX really brilliant for fine, fine control. Ah, question. Yeah, Carl, so if you're using Word, what do you do with like um, equations and stuff? Oh, God. Yeah. Um, not as, have as few equations as possible. Mm-hmm. That, um, you really have no hope but to have to use the equation editor that's in Word, um, or just sort of shove them in with um, special symbols. Okay. But I. Um, is there not a way? Don't have it. Is there Sorry. not a way to do it in in LaTeX and then like export? like a single equation as like a like an image or something? Or is that not a way to do it? Yeah, you could do that. Um, but I don't think that the journal will like it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you could do that. There might and there there might be systems for getting from LaTeX to the equation editor thing in Word. But okay. I, I'm not, my my approach has been to just use as few um, equations as I can. Yeah, I've never I've never tried to use the equation editor in Word. Is it a nightmare? Is it just not for stats? 
it it can be it's actually it's not too bad really it does i mean it it it's kind of has the same behavior as is making a table in word that you get these little cells and you can you can have quite a lot of control and make some pretty fancy equations in word but it, it's like um you know a lot of brute force you know do it by hand kind of way about it um versus have I, I, I mean, I prefer lots of backslash codes as you do in LaTeX instead. It definitely makes you want to simplify the equations as much as possible. Got it. Okay. So, and you can use LaTeX code in the word equation editor. So that's cool. That's something new. Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, the world has gotten better, so that's worth looking into. So that, I mean, learning the, the, the amount of LaTeX to make equations and to have some control over equations is worthwhile, whether you're using, um, LaTeX full force for your documents or whether you're just relying on R Markdown, because much of the time you can use those LaTeX equations in R Markdown. And if you can now use it within the Word Equation Editor, that is brilliant. Um, but I, I still see value in learning LaTeX for um, really fine control over documents. The, it, it may still just be... Um, I mean, I mean, the thing is, is I've been using LaTeX for 25 years, and so I have a lot of experience I can draw on to make, um, to 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 get over problems that come up in LaTeX and to really have that control. I don't have that same experience with, you know, CSS that I would use to try to have better control over over our Markdown output, um, and so I'm. While I, I would probably be better off switching to Jeringen for slides, um, I'm still making these slides in LaTeX because it's just um, inertia on my part. You know, just as in Word, floating tables and figures can be a pain in LaTeX. Um, and just as in wait until the absolute last moment to try to put them into place. Um, you can use Knitter with LaTeX the same way as you use Knitter with Markdown. So you can have your, your LaTeX based documents be fully reproducible. You can have every number, figure and table in your paper be fully reproducible. Um, the tabular, making tables in LaTeX gives you a lot of control but can be really painful. This, this X table package is really brilliant for making tables in in LaTeX. Um, I've come to believe you should. It's probably best to separate out the code that you use to make figures rather than have that R code within the LaTeX document itself. Um, it makes it easier to reuse those those figures for other other means and. By all means, use version control on your papers the same way as you might use version control on your your R package or your data analysis project. Um, and th that's one of the benefits of using R Markdown in LaTeX is that version control um, is more natural. That it, you know, basically for seeing what has changed between versions of a document. I'll turn off the recording.